First of all, let's be clear, we know there are no conclusive proofs that fit on a realist chassis. There are no conclusive proofs possible in a reality that holds contingent proofs and relativism is the only possible truth form. In short it is unreasonable for atheists to ask for proofs of God, based on criteria they reject for their own proofs. Normally when proof is required experimental proof is what is expected, though logical proofs are also possible. An experimental proof is something of a misnomer and may mislead, as it actually represents and supports a naturalist conception of reality. Secularists have misappropriated the term experiment to mean tests based on the assumption physical reality is real, and therefore, absolute certainty is not possible. Modern scientific experiments are basically propositions to the effect that if physical reality is real or given the assumption that the world is phenomenological, then what results from X? X being the experiment. X establishes what we can be certain of within certain parameters, meaning we cannot ever be 100% certain about anything. This kind of thinking prohibits all but phenomenological explanations from being accepted. Phenomenological explanations for phenomenon exclude God, meaning there are no phenomenological explanation for God. This is so for several reasons. The primary reason God cannot be proven to exist phenomenologically is that God is not physical. This ought not alarm us, neither is reality a naturalist creation. It is well known among intellectuals that the physical reality hypothesis excludes metaphysical truths. Which is why experiments meant to substantiate the physical reality hypothesis are limited to contingent conclusions. Therefore, no number of experiments are sufficient to prove conclusively that the world is composed of a physical substance. By the same token, these experiments remain insufficient to make metaphysical propositions irrelevant or moot. The secular hypothesis that claims metaphysics is incoherent requires metaphysics for its arguments. No number of experiments will make metaphysics redundant and all claims to the contrary rely on metaphysical arguments. There are no absolute truths outside of metaphysics. The ability of atheists to dismiss proofs of God has more to do with their intellectual environment than with the proofs themselves. There is no proof or argument that cannot be argued against or claimed to be only provisional in the physical realm. It is beyond dishonest to claim a proof of God fails to meet a standard that does not exist. Every argument that is not incoherent meets the atheist's standard of proof. Every secular proposition and theory is based in probability, expresses relativist truth and considered contingent. If the argument is not a contradiction the possibility exists for it to be true, in a relativist framework. Yet in the Bible it is said that God spoke the world into existence, and it was good. Good is not a term one applies to rocks and large swaths of water. Good is a moral term and is applied to information and conditions. Good in the biblical sense can mean true or honestly formed. It can mean it is nice in a human sense. The world God created has moral perfection. The creation achieved a standard devised by God and by the terms of that standard, what he created was good. The problems we see are of man's invention. God created a moral paradise. Eden was a place of moral perfection. Satan introduced a divisive even hateful argument. When he asked, did God really say you could not eat of any tree in the garden, he was creating doubt about God in the mind of Eve. He was sowing division. He was implying there was a standard beyond that devised by God. God was implicitly being judged. Eve replied that of the tree in the middle of the garden, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Eve transformed an issue concerning standards into an ethical issue concerning law, claiming that to even touch the tree would bring on the curse of death. But what the devil did was imply there was a standard higher than God's. She was told she would not surely die if she ate of the fruit. The standard God has set was a ruse to harm man. 
the law is top-down and enforced from without. Moral truths or standards are logical and rational. Standards contain their own penalty. Moral truths are not enforced they are principles to live under. They guide us to help us understand the way the world works. If we take what does not belong to us we will cause harm. You eat of the fruit you will die only means one cannot disobey God and be better off for it. It is not that someone will kill you it is that you have betrayed the source of life. Adam and Eve when they betrayed God did die to him. Trust was broken. The fall is represented by separation. Adam and Eve were ejected from the garden, and they attempted to hide from God, physically. The recognition of their physicality is reinforced by their attempt to hide their physical nakedness using fig leaves. God mentions the work Adam will have to endure and the pains of physical childbirth that will be the woman's lot, further enhancing the image of the fleshy state that results when we are separated from God. God chose the Jews to represent the futility of the law. It was a burden placed on Israel because the law cannot save us. We are destined always to fall short of God's perfection under the law. Were we even able to achieve full compliance within the law, this level of obedience only makes us legalists, we cannot become good or moral by means of the law. The law does not respond or have a solution to our separation from God. However, we need to understand fully the futility of the law to act as a real moral standard, to understand the standard argument that God must exist to have standards. The law, without power, is merely opinion and means nothing. The average man can voice his opinion but nothing changes. The man who rules by divine law only has to voice an opinion and it becomes the law of the land in perpetuity. However, even this is not the full story, for if the king is merely a figurehead his opinion may not hold much more weight than the opinion of one of his subjects. Enforcement is required to ensure the law is fulfilled. A law is opinion codified into a regulation administrated by means of judicial coercion or alternatively, the law is an opinion issued as a regulation backed up by force, which in its modern manifestation, is referred to as a justice system. In other words, the regulation and codification is less important than the presence of a system of enforcement. This means there needs to be a power disparity between the ruled and the ruler. This may seem simple enough, but it poses a problem. To start with the law always necessitates social divisions. The average man cannot issue an opinion and have it become law but a ruler cannot expect to rule without the means to reward those who enforce his regulations. But no one has this kind of money so the state must address the issue of financing. And this naturally causes greater social division. There must be resistance in the regulated because it is invariably the most regulated persons who are the ones financing the major portion of the costs of the regulatory apparatus. If there is no God, there is physical reality, causality and all of those things usually associated with the secular view of life. The secular view is what we call liberalism. Liberalism is always tied to an ethical system. In ethical systems right and wrong are based on legal precedent. It's okay to drive at 80 km per hour and illegal to drive at 81 km per hour. That is the way the law works. You can own a machine gun south of the 49th parallel but not north of the 49th parallel. In an ethical system there are rules for everything that is supposed to reflect the standard. Right and wrong is divided by the law. Behind every system of ethics there is a lawgiver and law enforcer. This creates a division between the law administrators and the law subjects. Division in a moral or spiritual sense means there is a conflict regarding financing. If there is no conflict over who pays the cost, there is no division. The creation, enactment and enforcement of law requires power disparities in the expropriation of wealth because the law cannot pay for itself. How this is done must lay with the lawmakers, for they must always have the ultimate decision-making power. 
Ethical systems always have divisions based on who pays and who benefits, for they are never the same person or group. The alternative to ethics is morality. Morality means the creator of a cost pays the cost and the creator of value retains the value earned. There is no source of division in a moral system and therefore there is order. However, we have demonstrated that no ethical system can create order because they invariably produce social costs and therefore division. The church is based on faith. Most of us assume this is a faith in Christ, but we rarely think much on what the standard of faith is. We create our own standard for what living in faith means. However, if we are saved by faith, it cannot be our faith that saves us, otherwise this is tantamount to saving ourselves by our own hand. It would take our faith in God to save us. But if God saves who He chooses without any human component, that amounts to something like a random process. The solution to this paradox comes in the form of the church. We are saved by faith, but it is the faith of the church. It is the biblical church that has not been factored into the puzzle. What we the church bind on earth, is bound in heaven and what we loose on earth, is loosed in heaven. However, this ought to be seen as mutual reinforcement. Belief in Jesus will not save us, otherwise there could be no fallen angels or Satan. The dynamics of Christian salvation make no sense in the way that it is normally considered. If we are saved by grace, what does faith matter? If we are saved by faith, what does God matter? If we are saved by faith alone, then faith is irresistible. God in this scheme of things, becomes akin to someone who anoints us in recognition of our faith. If we subscribe to the view of salvation as preached in the Christian churches, then either the faith of the individual saves him, or God chooses him at random. It is obvious something is missing from the conventional view of the salvation process. All we really know is there is no amount of works that can save us. Works are not sufficient to eternally condemn us, but they never reach to the point where they can save us. But there is still a standard below which we are beyond salvation and a level at which we are assured of God's grace, but works does not push us one way or another on this scale. Morality is not possible in the liberal system nor in a Christianity divorced of standards. Liberal Christians embrace law in the form of doctrine and in compliance to the state's regulatory system. We are to live by faith, not doctrine. A Priorian is an ecumenical organization that ties morality to the building of the church. A Priorian ecumenics accepts the basic tenets of Christianity, belief in God the Father, Jesus Christ as the Son of God, and the Holy Spirit. The death, descent into hell, resurrection, and ascension of Christ. The holiness of the church and the communion of saints. Christ's second coming, the day of judgment and salvation of the faithful. A Priorian Ecumenics is an organization grounded in morality and in faith not in law. We believe our faith is tied up with the works of faith that produce the fruits of faith and these fruits culminate in the universal church. We are saved by grace, for salvation is never earned. But faith in Christ has to be considered impossible without the church. That is, faith is without works, outside of the church as the church is the fruit of our works of faith. Man in the singular does not have faith because he cannot do works in Christ without the church. It is the church that represents the bride of Christ and the body of Christ and therefore the vehicle by which we are saved. That is we cannot claim to a faith in Christ if we have no faith in the body of Christ, of which we are to be part. As a Christian we are inherently part of the body of Christ. What remains to be considered is if this body, the church, has a purely subjective identity or if there is a substantial basis to it. Regardless, it is a far different thing if we are saved by faith in Jesus or if we are saved by faith as a kind of spiritual power. Because without the qualifier, our faith becomes the source of our salvation. 8 For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. 9 Not of works, lest any man should boast. 
10 For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Ephesians 8 Smiley Face Salvation remains a gift of God because it cannot be earned. But it is through our faith that grace is extended. The distinction being described in Matthew 18 verse 18 Verily I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Faith demonstrates the existence of God by results that can be had by no other way. Faith necessitates God for without God there is no church and no foundation for faith. But faith has minimal standard, it is not subjective, it has to build the church. The standard Christians live by is defined by the church. Christianity is built by a top-up process not the top-down process the world uses. The church is built in faith through the redeeming work of Christ, by works of faith. However, building the church requires we live by a standard set by God. Our faith must contribute to the body of Christ. We must build the church. Without the standard set by ecumenics, the body becomes infected with social costs including unemployment, debt, poverty, inflation, pollution, waste, taxation, homelessness, war, property crime, and the cost of the state. When faith is tied to works of faith that build the church, social costs are eliminated. We cannot do that which divides the body and destroys the church. We as Christians living in faith cannot create social costs. We must be ecumenical. If all social costs, up to and including the cost of the state, can and will be eliminated by the ecumenical church, ecumenics becomes unequivocal evidence for the existence of God.